Hey guys, it's Alex Rally, and welcome to an episode of the Hand of the Day. Continuing on, I'm doing something different in my Hand of the Day episodes. I'm taking a mixture of hands to review them here to make the episode even more dynamic and fun for you guys. So I'm taking a hand here from High Stakes Poker, I'm reviewing some of the biggest hands in the world I've ever played, hands that you guys have probably seen before, and give you guys my thoughts on them. But for now, let's go on to the Hand of the Day, brought to you by 888 Poker. This hand is an epic one. Probably, you've, if you watch uh, at all high stakes poker, you've probably seen this hand. Uh, it's between Tom Dwan, Peter Eastgate, um, former main event champion, and Barry Greenstein. This hand kicks off with Barry Greenstein opening under the gun to 2,500. Decent size raise. Barry Greenstein is a very, very tight player. His opening range under the gun is very, very strong. Something to keep in mind throughout this video. Pretty much everybody calls after Barry opens. Uh, Tom, uh, David Benamin, Eli Lezra, Zygmunt, Negranu, Eastgate, and Brunson in the big blind. So let's talk about the preflop flop hands really, really quick. Tom calling in second position is loose, but it's fine. A lot of people here with three better fold. Some people would call. With Tom's particular image and Tom's post-flop playing ability and his playing style, I think calling with Queen-10 suited here, it goes well with his overall game plan. He has a very complex game plan. I've played a lot of high stakes poker with Tom and Macau, and he can get away with calling with hands like these because he's so creative post-flop that he mixes up his play well enough and he's balanced enough and he's good enough at hand reading that he can get away with making um, suboptimal calls pre-flop against very, even against very, very tight opens like Barry Greenstein. Benjamin calls in third position with threes, which in a really, really deep stack cash game, it's like it's a troublesome hand to play I and mean, you might get squeezed behind you where you're going to have to fold and a lot of the times that you flop a set, you're on the bottom end and in a lot of multi-way pots, this hand is very tough. It's okay, I guess it's fine, I'm, I'm not in love with it. Alessra calls with Jack 9 offsuit, which is terrible, I think it's a terrible call. Um, Zygmunt calls with 7-6 off, which is less bad than Alessra, but it's still still bad, it's way too loose. Negranu calls on the button with King-4 suited, fine. Eastgate calls in the small blind with 4-2 off, terrible. Um, it's way too loose of a call. Uh, in the small blind are in the worst position. Um, I guess nobody has you covered, but like, not any, nothing really good could happen with 4 deuce off. And Brunson calls in the big blind with ace nine. He closes the action, he's getting a great price. His hand plays terribly post flop, but like given that he's getting such a good price, um, I would call here. I guess I'm, I'm harping on Eastgate's call a little, a, a lot. I know he's getting excellent odds, but I just think it's so hard to play this hand out of position. If it was suited, I would probably call, maybe call, but um, I think you have to have a little bit more going into the flop with a hand like this out of position. So anyway, we go to the flop like seven ways. Pot's 20,000. Flop is 10 deuce deuce rainbow. Eastgate checks and Greenstein now bets out. Eastgate and Brunson check. Greenstein bets out 10,000, which is a small bet relative to the size of the pot. But I like his bet size here. On a super, super dry board like this, where like you are representing an overpair and you either have your opponents crushed or possibly they have you crushed if they have a two or tens full. Like you don't really need to bet big. Greenstein's repping an overpair, he's repping a ton of strength, he bet into seven people. The pot is also very, very big relative to the game because like seven people called preflop. So even though he's betting half pot, it's still a big bet relative to the stack sizes and to the game. And I think his $10,000 bet is fine. That being said, I think it's really, really like difficult for him to get called by a worse hand. Like I think some players are gonna call with a 10, so I understand going for value here. That's fine, but like you're not gonna get multiple streets from a 10. If they call the flop, they're gonna like fold the turn. And I think a lot of people, even if they have like jack 10, are just gonna fold the flop because it's just like not the flop they're looking for. Greenstein bet out, which he probably wouldn't do with bluffs, so that condenses his range even more to over pairs. And it's just like really, really tough to play. So I don't think you're getting a lot of value if you're Greenstein. I would probably check here, and I would probably check my entire range if I'm Barry. I just wouldn't have a betting range here. Um, or I would bet my entire range and rep some over pairs depending on the table. Like, I would consider doing one or one or, I, like I understand that both are kind of complicated. Like if you check too often, then like you miss the chance of firing out when you have air. And if your opponents are gonna fold a 10, then they're pretty much never gonna call you on the flop, so you should bet all the time. So I, I would mix it up. 
Betting is a half pot is fine, checking is fine. Um, you make sure you're balanced. Anyway, so Greenstein bets 10,000 and Tom now makes it 37,300. Eastgate overcalls in the small blind and Barry overcalls after, re after betting the flop. So let's take a look at what people can have in this spot. What, what are people representing and how should people be playing their hands on the flop? So Barry betting, we talked about that. There's pros and cons to betting, betting is fine. Um, and Tom makes it 37,300. This is a spot where I think it gives some credence to what I was saying before about Barry's lead. Tom knows right away that his hand is no good here. He knows that he can't profitably call the flop. So the play most of the time is just to fold your hand here because it's too likely your opponent has an overpair. Or if he doesn't have an overpair, he could keep barreling on a myriad of turns. Any jack, queen, king, or ace, he could barrel. And Tom has a very, very tough decision facing Barry's bet on the flop in the turn. So Tom knows he can't call the flop here. So he's going to divide his range. He's going to either fold or he's going to raise. So Tom knows right away that he's bluffing on this flop. There's absolutely no doubt in his mind. He's raising the flop to get Barry to fold an overpair by the river. I actually think in a weird, sick way, like he won't even mind Barry calling the flop just because he knows that he's gonna get Barry to fold by the river, trying to represent this hand. Now, Eastgate overcalls in the small blind. So of course, Eastgate's range for overcalling here is very, very, very narrow, right? It's not capped either. He could have quads and he could have tens full, meaning he could still have all the, the, the nutted hands. Um, but it's like, he could also have a lot of deuces, right? Those are the only hands he could have. So he could either have trips, quads, or tens full. I think that's it. So I think that Eastgate's calling here with a lot of deuces preflop, not just because I see that he has four deuce, but I would expect Eastgate to have all suited deuces preflop. Like even something like six deuce suited, maybe not seven deuce or eight deuce or nine deuce, but like jack deuce suited, queen deuce, king deuce, ace deuce, and like six deuce, five deuce, four deuce, three deuce. So he has a lot of twos, and of course he has one combination of tens full because Tom has 10, so he blocks tens full, that's really, really important. And then he has like some combinations of really, really strong deuces like ace deuce that could be ahead of Tom's range if Tom has a worse deuce, right? So Tom is repping a full house or trips and green stuff, and Eastgate just always has those hands. Like Tom could have some bluffs, Eastgate never has anything except trip deuces. This is pretty much the worst hand that he overcalls the flop with, four deuce. Now Greenstein overcalls, he's getting a good price. Um, he's getting like four to one. He overcalls with two aces, which I really don't like. He pretty much can never win this hand. Eastgate, he's never ahead of Eastgate's range. So he's basically calling to hit an ace on the turn. Um, I don't like calling for two outs here. I mean, you're like, you, know, you don't have the right price to call and you're never have, you never have the best hand. Also, you have to fold if Tom bets the turn, even if Tom is bluffing. So Greenstein never wins this hand. So I would fold on the flop here. Um, he's never ahead of Eastgate and he doesn't really have any options, right? The one thing that's interesting about Greenstein's hand is that he blocks Tom having ace deuce. So, he, you know, he has an ace of hearts and Tom could only have ace deuce suited. So there's only one possibility that Tom has ace deuce, right? So when Greenstein overcalls the flop, Tom has a ton of information, right? Because Tom knows that Eastgate has a deuce or quads or tens full, and he knows that Greenstein has an overpair. So in a weird, weird, sick way, the fact that Barry overcalled the flop helps Tom because Tom now knows that Barry has an overpair. If Barry has an overpair, he probably has something like kings or aces. And if he has kings or aces, it's way less likely that Eastgate has ace deuce or king deuce. So Greenstein overcalling the flop helps Tom a ton because now he knows that it's much more likely that Eastgate has a weak deuce. And it's also very, very unlikely that Eastgate has 10s full because there's one combination of 10s full because Tom has a friggin' 10. So it's much harder for Tom to bluff when Greenstein folds. It's also like, from Eastgate's point of view, Eastgate now has to be worried about Barry behind him, and he also has to think that Tom is less likely to bluff in a multi-way pot, even though we just discovered that's not actually true. So the turn goes check, 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 and Tom, in his absolutely sick fashion, comes out 
guns blazing, and bets here. I think Tom's plan is to go three streets here. He's always going to bet the river. And I think he knows that like Eastgate might call this turn a lot, but I think his logic is very similar to what it was on the flop. In a weird, sick way, he doesn't even mind if Eastgate calls the turn, of course, unless Eastgate has tens full or quads, because even if Eastgate has something like four deuce and he calls the turn, like, Eastgate is probably going to fold the river because he's not going to think that Tom is going to bluff again. So Tom still can win this pot even if Eastgate calls the turn. So Eastgate calling the turn isn't actually that bad because Eastgate's almost never going to call the river unless he has like ace deuce, quads, or tens full. So I actually don't even mind like Tom's bet here. And I think Eastgate knows that Tom knows that Eastgate's range is a deuce. So in other words, Eastgate knows his hand is face up, and Eastgate knows that it looks like he has a two or tens full or quads, and so he's thinking to himself, this is the worst hand I could have, this is the bottom of my range, I don't need to call with the worst hand I could have because so often I'm gonna have better hands than this, um, so you don't need to call with the worst hand that you could have, and also like, why would Tom ever bluff me here if he knows I have a deuce and he knows I'm not gonna fold the deuce? So that's sort of like some of the higher level thinking that's going on, which is what makes this bet so good. Tom also bets very close to the pot. He bets 104,000, which is a really, really good bet because he wants to build this pot and he wants his opponent to know that calling this bet on the turn means he's gonna call it an all in on the river. And so Eastgate knows that like calling 104,000 means he's really calling the rest of his entire stack. So Tom's risking 100,000 and Eastgate is essentially risking his entire stack and so is Barry. And so this bet for Tom is very, very lucrative, even though he has the worst hand and even though it's so likely that his opponents have really, really strong hands that could potentially consider calling. So I really love this analysis by Tom and this is why like, he compensates for the fact that he's super loose pre-flop, he's hyper aggressive, he sometimes considered like spazzy, he sometimes does get out of line because he plays so many hands. He has to compensate for that post-flop with, you know, hyper-aggression, but he's extremely good at hand-reading and understanding these subtle nuances in the game and taking advantage of situations where other people simply aren't capable of doing that. I learned a lot playing from Tom and Macau, and there's spots like these where, you know, he really does distinguish himself as one of the best in the world. So props to Tom, amazing bluff, very, very sick, and um, he got it through. Congrats. So Eastgate folds, Peter folds, Eastgate folds, Greenstein folds, and Tom finds himself winning a quarter million dollar game. Awesome, buddy. Well done. That's it for today's episode of the Hand of the Day. If you like this episode, please subscribe to my channel or share it with someone that you think would enjoy it as well. I would greatly appreciate that. And if you want to submit your hands to me, please send them to me on my blog, alectrelli.com, and you can send them all to me there. That's it, guys, and I will see you next week for the Hand of the Day. Thanks for watching. Cheers.